This is the initiation of a new seminar series, uh, and I hope it will last. This term we have three, and um, so Prakash is sort of inaugurating it for us. And um, uh, I'm very pleased, particularly because I know Prakash for at least 10, 12 years from London. We probably met at the SOAS pub, pub, right? Then, or whatever, right. And Prakash is a reader at uh, Queen Mary University in London. He's also the director of what is called GLOCUL, the Center for Culture and Law, works increasingly uh, in issues relating to religion, has worked a lot on immigration law. So it's, it's good that we get a dose of legal theory, which, which we normally lack in the humanities. And I think a lot of interesting anthropological work is done in relation to law theory. I think Heiko will vouchsafe for me on that. Uh, what Prakash does is he specializes in legal pluralism in religion and law, ethnic minorities and diasporas in law, immigration, refugee, and nationality law, comparative law, with particular reference to South Asia. And of course, I mean, goes without saying that he's published widely and lectured internationally in all these fields. A very, very enviable CV he has. Um, he's, he's worked in uh, SOAS in London, and also in Kent, wasn't it Kent, yes. right? And, um, and he joined uh, Queen Mary probably 2002, around yes. the time I met you, I suppose. Yes. So I, I don't want to take his time away and just pass it on to you to you know, tell us about what you're going to argue today. Okay. All right. Th thank you very much, Prem, first of all, for your, uh, inviting me um, and also hosting me, which is really kind of you. Um, and uh, actually, I didn't hesitate when when Prem said, you know, we're doing, we're thinking of doing a series of seminars here. Why don't you come along and so on? The only thing was how to tweak it so that it fits within, you know, your interests. But uh, largely, I think we could manage it quite uh, quite nicely. Um, and what's uh, interesting is that uh, the the topic that I've chosen to you today, I've been working on for um, something like two, may, maybe going on for three years. Um, not only as an academic, but also as a kind of quasi activist. So I'm I've been been working with uh, Indian community organizations in the UK uh, to enable them to sort of gear up to be able to represent their case before the government bodies, before the uh, various equality institutions and uh, NGO uh, uh, in their interlocutor kind of roles as interlocutors with other uh, NGOs and so on. Um, with respect to uh, the legislation that we now have on the statute book, uh, which which is in the Equality Act, uh, on caste, specifically the provision in the Equality Act which relates to caste and, and therefore caste discrimination. Um, so British law is actually happens to be the first, in, uh, first jurisdiction actually anywhere in the world which has a civil law anti-discrimination provision on caste. Uh, I know Indians have provision, legal provisions on caste, those of you who are studying about India, uh, but they are framed uh, either on the basis of criminal law or, or on the basis of uh, reservations or quotas for certain uh, groups and so on. So India actually, uh, Britain has not followed the Indian example, right? Uh, so there are certain legal distinctions there. I know the Nepalese have also recently uh, uh, instituted legislation on caste, but it's again quite different. And it's also premised on uh, intervention through crim criminal law. Um, I have my own sort of critique of the Nepali <laughs> legislation and so on, which I find extremely stark and quite weird, actually. <laughs> but we can go into that later on if, you, if you're interested in. I know that Mauritius has a provision, constitutional provision on caste, uh, but it's, as far as I know, it's never really been affected in law and it's not really uh, in legislative terms. And it's, as far as I know, it's never really been used in litigation and so on. Right? So Britain actually stands out. It could be a model for other Western countries. Um, my own position is that it should not be a model for anybody. <laughs> Right, so because I take a very contrarian position, I since I began to be involved in the uh, sort of as a quasi activist and as, as an academic, if you like, as a public intellectual as well, um, in in it, you know intervening in in the controversy around the caste legislation, I've taken a stand stand against the legislation, right, uh, which is of course very. If, if you're sitting in Europe and you say you're against caste discrimination, how can you be against caste discrimination? But that's exactly the position that I'm taking, right. So, 
if you want to leave the room now, <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. Or get your eggs ready, eggs and tomato, rotten tomatoes and stuff out the bag right now. Um, so um, so I'm, I, I'll, I'll talk you through the, uh, the, the legislation and so on. Um, oh, this is weird. How come this? It doesn't show the full slide. Yeah? It, no, it cuts off the... Yeah. Can you scroll or something? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's a question of scrolling, is it? No. Is there a way of opening the one window fully or something? Yeah, that might be the way to do it. No. Uh, it's it's actually bad for you because I can see the whole slide here, but you you guys can't <laughs> see it. Uh, Astro, do you know, do you know this is your computer? Can you see it's cut off there? At the, it should it should uh, we should actually see more of the same slide. There's some bits at the top which is cu cut off. Is there any other way of doing this? Unplug it and plug it back in. Your adapter there. That's better. You can see it there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And yeah, it's come oh, yeah. on. Oh yeah. Okay. It's yeah. Um, so the basic presuppositions which have gone into the drafting of the uh, Equality Act provisions on caste discrimination um, are that uh, Indians have a caste system, right? Uh, who can disagree with that? Uh, I I disagree with that proposition yeah, as as a theoretical proposition. Um, caste system has been exported to the countries of diaspora. This has also been a claim made by people who have been advocating on uh, for, for the need to have legislation in, in British law uh, against caste discrimination. And I also dispute that. Um, and of course, they, they say that we need legislation and case law to cover caste-based discrimination. I also dispute that claim. Um, I will talk about aspects of the, the legislation and case law today to you, and I think that that's, that's actually one of, one of the first steps that I want to kind of like just clear the ground, explain what the legislation basically does, uh, what are the basic presuppositions behind it. Um, and then I, I take the argument to, to the next level, which is like to look at the kind of framework within, within which the assumptions which deliver the caste legislation to the UK statute book um, are based on a framework of Christian theology, Orientalism, and what I call colonial consciousness, which these, all, all, in fact, all of these are borrowed terms, actually, right? Christian theology is, of course, relatively uncontested. Orientalism, most of you have heard about it as an idea, right? Some of you have read Edward Said's book and so on. Uh, colonial consciousness is a phrase that I draw from the work of uh, S.N. Balagangadhara in his recent book on reconceptualizing India studies, right? Uh, where he talks about the persistence of a kind of uh, attitude of colo uh, colonial knowledge, let's say, right, uh, among contemporary Indian, Indian intellectuals. Um, so I think the combination of those three actually help to frame the idea of caste and caste system in contemporary Indian culture and also the, in, the, in the culture of the Indian diaspora uh, to the extent that a case for legislation is sort of made necessary, if you like, or is deemed to be necessary, um, becomes intelligible, right? Uh, is, is, as, is comprehensible, if you like, as, as a proposition. Um, what uh, I, additionally, I contend that uh, ideas of the caste uh, system, uh, arguably also of caste, actually don't make sense out, outside of that framework, right? So you, it's necessary for us to work from within a framework of Christian theology, its development through Orientalism and colonial consciousness in order for the idea of the caste system and all its discriminatory, inherently discriminatory aspects to make sense, right? Uh, and for us to want to legislate against it. Um, now, one of the things uh, I did actually, and this is particularly in response to um, uh, Prem's prodding, if you like, if, if I may kind of just kind of do... Um, uh, a play on 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 your surname, yeah, because you, you're a podder, podder, aren't you? So you prodded me uh, into <laughs> into also thinking through or, or linking this this these issues to the idea of citizenship, right? Many of you will be familiar with Tariq Modud's work uh, on multicultural citizenship. I don't know how many how many you are, how many of you are, right? Uh, but I would just say a few things about that. I mean, one of his basic ideas about the framework of multicultural citizenship, particularly as he sees it ha having developed in the British context, is that he argues 
um, that it's an inherently f uh, flexible system, right? Uh, so as new diaspora groups and, in fact, new uh, indigenous, not only indigenous populations, but also new diaspora groups have come, settled in Britain and made certain claims on the public sphere, on the legal system, etc. The legal system ha or, and the public sphere generally has been able to show a, a measure of adaptability. Right, to those demands and claims and so on. So his basic thesis is that here is a, almost a kind of ideal system which which um, adapts with time, right? Is not stuck in a certain type of frame. And of course, his his counterpoint to that is perhaps the French system, which is strongly you know flavored by laicite, is unable to move like this way or that way to accommodate the demands of new cultural minorities or religious minorities and so on. So he sees the British model as a relatively favorable kind of. Uh, uh, Model, I think, yeah, Heiko, we were talking about this last night. Yeah, it, it is, of course, he does propagate that as a kind of model. The whether or not it's transferable to other countries and so on is a, is a very open question, actually. I think it cannot just be transferred because you need a particular historical constellation, right? A particular kind of conf cultural config configuration for it to even make sense within the British context, which may not exist elsewhere. So we can leave that aside. But his basic thesis is that there is this accommodative structure, right? Which changes with, with time, with new demands on the system, public sphere, etc. cetera. Um, now, I say that that thesis doesn't capture what's actually going on within the, um, within the, um, uh, contemporary setting in Britain, when, it, when we start, when we turn the gaze towards what's happening with the legislation in relation to caste, and the way in which the, the um, uh, Indian, uh, Indian, Indian diaspora communities have been projected in the public sphere, in, within legislation, and the extent to which they've been able to have their case heard, right, vis-a-vis -vis the prospect of the introduction of the caste legislation. So I say that this is actually a counterpoint, yeah, and Modud's model is actually unable to tell us much about that. Um, yet, I, I would also say that if we argue that contemporary citizenship regimes, let's say in a place like Britain, are framed around the, the dynamic of secularization of Christianity, I think that is a better explanation, actually, for what is happening within the British framework with respect to the caste legislation. Right? So I would, I, I would actually want to substitute Tar Tariq Modu's explanation altogether and look at the way in which British culture, I don't deny that there's, a, there's been a multiculturalism in the British context, right? But I see that as part and parcel of a secularization of Christianity, right? So Christian theological ideas, which, know, which are sort of uprooted from their theological base uh, and are generalized within the culture. Right? So that, that's how I would frame the contemporary citizenship context in Britain, and, and actually much more widely in the Western world. I think there are parallel processes going on everywhere in the Western world, which enable us to provide better explanations for the kind of dynamics we see operating within cultural systems, recognition systems, yeah, recognition of alterity, and so on. But we can flesh that out in discussion if necessary, because uh, I think I don't have time necessarily to go into all that. Okay, uh, we can, you can see the full slide now. Now, as far as the legislation is concerned, I do need to provide this background because it, I'm, I'm sure that not everybody's necessarily familiar with it. Uh, many people are sort of surprised when you say that, oh, well, Britain actually is one of those jurisdictions which has a provision on caste discrimination. Really? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, in 2010 already, yeah, it was there. In the original version of the 2010, it was brought in as an amendment. Yeah, you will be, be aware that legislative processes take a period of time and there are sometimes amendments introduced at various stages in the legislative process. And so the, here was one such amendment um, introduced in order to make caste an aspect of race within the Equality Act, yeah, what became the Equality Act. So, so caste became an aspect of race. And that's a very significant, it's very significant to bear in mind. I'll explain later on why it's important that uh, that specific type of wording was chosen, right? So caste wasn't made an aspect of religion. It wasn't made an aspect of, obviously, it wasn't made an aspect of disability or, yeah, gender or whatever. It became an aspect of race. And that, that so, and race is one of the protected characteristics within the uh, Equality Act system. Right? So you have gender, you have age, you have disability, you have sexuality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So it comes within as a subset within the. And of course, when you say an aspect of, it connotes something. Yeah, it's like a face of. Yeah, it's a facet of kind of thing. Right. So it's another dimension of race, if you like. And uh, I'll explain later on uh, what the significance of that that is. And I think it has multi-level significance. Um, so, okay, although the government accepted at the last minute that this amendment could be passed, what they decided was that instead of having an obligation to introduce the provision on costs, um, they would uh, uh, put it into a kind of holding system, 
right? So yes, we will have it on the, uh, in the legislation, but we won't implement it immediately, right? And they also didn't want an obligation to implement. And part of the reason that the then Labour Party government, the majority government in the, uh, of, the, of the Labour Party in late uh, 2010, wanted to put it into a kind of holding area is because they thought we don't have the, uh, enough evidence about cost discrimination, right? We don't know. Yeah, we don't even know what cost is, right? And we don't have, we don't know how much evidence there is about the extent of cost discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. So they said, well, look, we need to research this. Once we have the evidence, then we can think about bringing it into force properly, right? So this is, this is what happened. So the 2010 formula of the legislation was, if you like, a provisional type of recognition of cost. It wasn't saying that cost is now part of UK law, right? It said we have the power to introduce it should we find that there's enough evidence. To do so. It wasn't an obligation on the government to introduce it. Uh, hence, hence, I'm saying the government could introduce the provision, right? But it need not at the same time. Um, so what the uh, government did is that it commissioned a report by the so-called National Institute for the Economic and Social Research, NISER. It's often known as NISER. Those who are familiar with the uh, the kind of short history of or, or in the, uh, uh, of, of the cost legislation. It's uh, often known as the NISA report, which also came out into 2010, late 2010. And there are various questions about the NISA's reports, methods and findings and so on. One of the, one of the question marks that people have is that um, the NISA re uh, report's research team was actually led to interview certain groups of people who were, who were suggested by the lobby organizations, which were already lobbying for the cost provision to be made an aspect of that, the legislation, right? So methodologically, they were pushed towards a particular type of sample. Um, the report itself, of course, doesn't say that there, uh, there is uh, cost discrimination broadly in Britain, right? They said that in order for us to establish that, we need to have a proper, properly funded large project, right? So the report's conclusions that themselves were quite provisional, if you like, right? They said it's possible that there may, there may be some discrimination which comes properly within the scope of the Equality Act. Not all types of discrimination do. For example, decisions to marry might not yeah, come with it because if that belongs within the private sphere. It's not captured by the Act. Uh, decisions about how to run one's religious buildings might not come into the framework of the legislation because that also might be subject to various except, except exceptions within the legislation, etc. And so the NISA uh, report team, although you could, you could argue about their methodology and so on, also actually could not commit to a finding that there is any extent of caste discrimination in, in Britain. Um, then, of course, you have this change of government in 2010. And so now you have a situation where a government, there is a coalition government after 2010. And they are responsible, responsible for implementing a piece of legislation which they didn't favor anyway. Right? So the Liberal Democrats perhaps may have favored it, but the majority partner of the coalition, the Tory government, does not favor the cost legislation at all. So you have this sort of very ambiguous situation of, hmm, what should we do now that we have this, you know, statute, uh, legislation on the statute book, which we didn't really want in the first place. Um, and of course, the details of any implementing provision would have to be left to a, an order, which is made by, yeah, a piece of secondary legislation, which has been made by the minister. So, um, Yet it seems like the uh, government was nevertheless minded to continue with the implementation program, right? uh, at least to, to make out that it, it was sort of yeah, carrying on with the old agenda, which, which had been set out legislatively. And um, one of the things it does is to commission what, what is our equalities body, our official equalities body, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, right? the EHRC, to uh, commission a study on um, how cost can be op uh, operationalized for the purposes of the legislation, right? So their remit is different from the NISA uh, study team's remit, right? Uh, the NISA study team's remit to tr was to try to find out the extent of cost discrimination, right? Is there a case for legislation? The EHRC team, uh, investigation team, is not asking the same question. What they asked was, how can we get cost to be best implemented through legislation, right? So they accept the principle that the legislation is there. Uh, they don't question the extent of cost discrimination. In, in, that's not their job, right? They've been tasked with a specific thing to inquire simply into uh, the best way of bringing forward the cost provision into law. Right? So it's, it's, it's a slightly different nuance that the EHRC research team has, uh, has to proceed with its own research, research agenda. Um, now, 
Um, of course, uh, there have been questions about the uh, process of commissioning the research, right? Because the, if you look at the research team that, that won the tender to actually do the research by the, for, from the EHRC, um, all the academics who constituted are all self-declared in, fa in, in favor of the legislation, right? So they're already predisposed to the idea that there is a need for legislation, that it's the right thing to do, etc. All we need to do is fi try to find the best way to implement. Right? Uh, and it's a combination of legal people, socio-legal researchers, uh, social scientists, anthropologists, etc., etc. People from religious studies back background. Uh, I hesitate to word the, use the word Indologists. I'm not really sure if there are any living Indologists in the world around today, but sort of people within the South Asian area expertise, if you like. Let, let me call it that, yeah? Because uh, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the term Orientalist became replaced by area studies, right? Well, certainly from the U.S. perspective, if, 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 if you believe people like uh, Nicholas Dirks and so on, right? So the area studies, let's call it South Asian area studies. Um, so you have a co combination of different uh, types of experts, but uh, they're all sort of in favor, basically, of the, uh, of the caste legislation. And, of course, they believe that caste, caste discrimination exists. Yeah, Indian society is made up of a kind of social structure which is inherently dis discriminatory, and that that social structure has tra been transplanted into the Indian diaspora, uh, and specifically in this case in Britain. Yeah, all of those seem to be sort of given things that they, they're, they're simply facts within the kind of further theorization which... Um, which th which they engage in, right? Um, it's interesting that the re both the, they issued two reports in 2014 in the spring of 2014, which is almost about a year ago today, um, and uh, both the reports. Well, one of them actually reports the findings of a stakeholders working group and a um, uh, an academic working working group, right? So they they had like, sort of separate meetings with two types of people, stakeholders on the one hand. Uh, academics on the other. Um, so that was all combined into one report. Then you have a report which is known as a socio-legal report, which, in which they go in, into much more detail on the legal background of different caste provisions in different countries, specifically India, Nepal, and so on, uh, the United Nations deliberations on caste discrimination, uh, and how specifically, yeah, for law, uh, caste discrimination provision can be operationalized within UK law. So they're sort of two distinct reports, but it's very useful to read them together because they, they, they share some co common authorship as well. There is there's some overlap between the authors. And as I said, of course, the, 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 uh, all the authors are sort of more or less committed, apart from the more technical people who help them with the databases and so on, who are also co-named as authors, as co-authors, but um, the research team is broadly in favor of the, the, the idea of the legislation anyway. Um, but they avoid defining what caste is, right? Um, which I found quite interesting. And in fact, they make a virtue of the fact that we need to have a very loose idea of what caste is, right? So they argue against precision, in a way, um, which again, I find quite interesting. Um, now, of course, the re reports uh, recommend that uh, legislation should be implemented, right? Um, and that it it is well within the bounds of the judici judiciary to be able to arrive at a reasonable idea of what caste is. So in a way, it's sort of exercise in not doing anything, right? Because they say, well, we can't really define caste, but we think that the judges will be able to, right? Because caste occurs everywhere, and they sort of repeat the kind of generic findings which you find more, more or less in every book on Indian culture or South Asian culture, that India has a caste system, and there it is, and, and, and so we don't, you know, and, and they might talk about different terms like jati and biradri and varna and, right, and, and, and various of these types of terms, which, which obviously tell us that there is a caste system in Britain, right? Uh, they sometimes, some of, some of, they go to some lengths to talk about the religious background of caste, but also specify that uh, caste might have a specific religious background in Hinduism, but that's no longer so. Right? So caste consciousness uh, is actually infiltrated. Other religious groupings, if, when, when they come from South Asian, uh, from, from a South Asian background, so caste is not just explicitly, uh, exclusively either contained within Hinduism, nor is it exclusively to do with Sikhs or yeah, uh, Muslims or Christians. Well, it, it kind of, it's an attribute which all South Asian groups somehow appear to share. Now, that particular line of thinking is actually very, very interesting. Right? Because later on I'm going to argue that, well, it's, so the idea of caste and caste system is actually something closely to do with the idea of Hinduism as the Indologists and Orientalists spoke about it and the Christian missionaries before them. But um, uh, here, here they're trying to get away from this kind of very Hindu-constrained idea of caste, if you like. Right? Now, why should they do that? 
right? Why, why, why do they want to do that? And you can say that, well, from a social scientific, scientific perspective, it actually makes sense because people from the churches regularly complain that, oh, caste is also infiltrating into our co congregations, blah, blah, blah. And this is the standard thing. And if you look at the newspaper reports in India, there's, there's constant complaint from the Christian um, churches, if you like, from the, from, the, uh, from the priests and so on, how caste is kind of affecting their congregations as well. So nothing new there. I think there's a specific reason why they're doing that, but we'll go into that in a second. Um, yeah, so here now we can actually go deeper into this idea of caste being self-evidently immoral, right? Uh, I started the, the talk by saying that, of course, everybody believes that there is a caste system in India, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's an inherent, inherent part of the social system, uh, and it's religiously sanctioned. Uh, partly you can say because it's religious, it's religiously sanctioned, it also uh, has moral connotations. But actually it's immoral because it, it's, if it's religiously sanctioned, it means that it's a system which obliges on religious grounds uh, people who are members of those, the, those religions to systematically discriminate, to routinely discriminate against each other on grounds of either Jati membership or Varna membership, etc., etc. Right. So it becomes an imher inherently immoral institution. Right. Um, now, just a bit of background. So who is arguing for the uh, legislation on caste discrimination? Uh, I've said Christians, right? This is in Britain, right? Christians, uh, Dalits, some Buddhist organizations, these Ambed Ambedkarite type of Buddhist organizations. Um, and of course, their supporters within parliament and academia. Um, Christians, I would say, in fact, have been at the forefront of the campaigning agenda. Uh, the amendment that I spoke about, in, which was introduced in 2010, uh, was actually introduced by a, a Christian bishop of the Church of England, Bishop of Oxford, right? So he's the one, <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Uh, uh, so he's the one who's sort of saying that here is something that needs attention and and so on. Um, it's also interesting that the uh, most of the organizations that are in support of the uh, caste uh, discrimination provision are themselves either Christian, ostensibly Christian, or like overtly Christian, or they are linked to, uh, or funded by uh, Christian proselytizing organizations. Right. So, that, hence part of part of my, sort of my hypothesis around this issue is that it's not. Uh, there's more to it than simply wanting to eradicate whatever kind of discrimination may be inherent to a system like caste. Right? Um, now, uh, one thing also I should say, right, uh, is that the 2010 provision, by 2013, actually a new amendment was passed to that. So in 2013, you get a small amendment, very tiny amendment, in the to the 2010 legislation, which transforms the idea that the government has a power to implement the provision to an obligation to implement the provision, right? So in 2013, there's a very small amendment that's made. So they all they do is change the wording from may implement to must implement, right? So it's just actually a change of one word, right? Which now obliges the government, right? The current government to uh, implement the legislation. So actually, if you look closely at the statute, statutory obligation now, it is an obligation, right? It's not just a mere power or a discretionary power. Um, and of course, that's also part and parcel of the kind of ongoing campaign that these, uh, these organizations and their supporters in and out of parliament have tried to orchestrate, yeah? because they were actually quite annoyed about the fact that the original legislation only contained a permissive power. So the government could easily dismiss their claims or right, claim that, oh, well, we haven't found enough evidence of discrimination, whatever. Now, the government's hands are tied. They have to do that. Whatever government comes in, if they, we have a general election coming up, we don't know what's going to happen. In fact, this is like most open general election that there's ever been, right? Uh, whatever government comes into power the next time, they will have to still carry this forward, right? Legally, un un unless they manage to change the legislation, of course, right? Which is a different there will be a different kind of scenario. Um, so one of the things that strikes you when you look at the uh, precedents uh, within anti-discrimination law is that here is a piece of legislation, the specific provision on caste, uh, which has been, uh, which comes out of demands uh, which, which have not been formulated from within the affected community groups, right? They come from outside the framework. Um, so, for example, if you look at the provisions, the, Tariq Modud talks about this a lot, right? The anti-discrimination provisions on religion, 
in English law, right? They were actually far ahead of the European Employment Directive, which has provision on religion, but only extends to employment, right? If you look at uh, the already our Equality Act, the British Equality Act from 2006, it took the provisions on religion and applied them across the board, yeah, like in parallel to the existing Race Relations Act, like provision of goods and services, housing and employment, of course, yeah, or education, et cetera, et cetera, right? So religion got a very broad brush kind of recognition, right, within the anti-discrimination law. And who were the main campaigning organizations for the relig uh, religion provisions in the anti-discrimination law? It was Muslims, right? So Muslims were saying that, look, we have, our mem members of our groups are experiencing discrimination. You have to now neatly include religion also as maybe in order as a way of, by way of extension extending the race relations legislation etc cetera, etc cetera. and that was done right so actually in a way you can say well modud is right that the british system is flexible enough to adapt to the demands within the public sphere within the legal system of new groups which seek recognition which seek protection of anti-discrimination law and and so on right um and of course modud uses anti-discrimination law as one of his key reference point for arguing for his model of multicultural citizenship Right? Uh, but that's not the way it happens here. You, here. Here, in the caste discrimination situation, you have a group of people saying that uh, there is discrimination right, uh, by another group of people, right? and we need to protect against that. Right? So it's not sort of led by the, um, by the group of people who actually become targets of the potential or ostensible, and in fact, you can say presumptive targets of the legislation, Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, etc. So, yeah. Um, another pe peculiar thing is about the exceptions and exemption exemptions which are built into the legislation. If, again, if you look at the religion provisions or even the provisions on sexuality and so on, you see that the Equality Act is not flat. It doesn't cover everybody equally. Right? In, or it doesn't cover all protected characteristics equally. There are all kinds of provi provisions uh, by way of exemptions and exceptions which are hedged, hedged around in the Equality Act. Right? So you see that the legislature has been quite careful to institute a system of those kinds of exemption stroke exceptions, right, in the legislation. In the, in the case of caste, there's, there's been no such announcement about uh, as to what kind of exemptions or exceptions will be appropriate, right? In fact, if you look at the EHRC reports, the authors there argued that, now, since caste is, quote-unquote, an aspect of race, and race has the fewest amount of um, uh, exemption and exe exceptions which apply to it, uh, Caste should be treated in a similar way. Yeah? So there, sh there should be as few possible exceptions or exemptions for, uh, for discrimination yeah? in, in, in that sphere, as, there, as applied to race generally. Right? Um, so there is no real system of consulting the communities to say, well, look, if we provide legislatively against, the caste, uh, against caste discrimination, how will your organization be affected? Now, it's a reality, actually, that when you look at the social organization of most of the Indian communities, right? E, or in fact, you could, let me put it in a different way slightly. Uh, the formal right, organizational structure which is adopted by most of the Indian, Indian communities, you see that they have associations which are maybe have charitable status under English law, etc. Right? But underneath that, right, there, there are organizations which are basically formed around uh, jati groups. Right? I don't know if ja jati, maybe some of you, you're working on Nepal, right? It'll be familiar to you, right? But jati, is, you, can, you can say, is a basic form of Indian social organization, which is often translates to caste, right? It's often, often translated into one of the ideas which lie behind caste. Right? Now, so if you have this broad brush anti-discrimination legislation, effectively you're, what you're saying is that you're, affecting, you're attacking the uh, organizational framework, the associational framework of most of the Indian communities in Britain, right? because that's how they constitute themselves. Uh, at a formal level, of course, they will, even if you get rid of the formal structures, they'll still continue to, with these kinds of social structures, right? but at informal level. Right? So all you're doing is sort of maybe affecting their charitable status, their ability to uh, raise funding, and so on and so forth, right? So their mode of autonomous self-organization is actually strongly, potentially affected by this legislation. Is there any discussion on that in the EHRC reports, in the NISA report, in Parliament? Zero, right? Nobody is seriously interested in, in any of that, right? So you see a, pro a systematic process of disengaging from any of the legitimate concerns which the Indian communities might and I, I don't see that in any way, shape, or form as conforming to what Tariq says about, I say, I say Tariq because I know him personally, <laughs> Tariq Modud says about, right, uh, his idea of multicultural citizenship. Um, 
Yeah. Um, the second to last uh, bullet point is about the link to proselytize, Christian proselytization in India. Uh, and of course, it's not just restricted to India, but India is, is, is the, if you like, case. Um, why do I put that there? Right? Uh, I already mentioned that most of the uh, lobby organizations which are favoring, yeah, the NGOs which are favoring the uh, enactment of the caste provision are themselves supported by the Christian churches and yeah, interested in proselytizing, proselytizing activities and so on. Of course, one of the main targets is India. Right? India has already been identified as one of the main grounds where we can win new converts. And yeah, uh, whereas you know Christianity is declining in the Western world, it's actually really the center of gravity is moving towards Asia. Probably, I mean, the Pope was recently in Asia saying all kinds of nice things, yeah, about how we need to find new souls and 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 what have you. So that's the fresh new territory. Now, but what's that got to do with? discrimination law in England, right? Well, am, I, am I not trying to kind of pursue a very tenuous case here? Now, if we go back to the idea that the proponents of the legislation have been trying to argue that caste is not restricted to just Hindus, right? It's not restricted to perhaps Sikhs, yeah, at the most, or Jains at the most. They're saying that Muslims are included, Christians are included as well, right? Now, if you just glance glance at the Indian theater, right? Now, I mentioned already that India has a system of reservations, right? So there, there are various quotas which apply to places for education in the public sector, institutions, uh, in government jobs, etc., etc., right? Which are all divided on the basis of caste, right? Uh, so you have these various uh, categories like scheduled tribes, scheduled, uh, scheduled castes, uh, other backward castes, etc., etc. So you have various types of laws at different levels, right? You have center laws at the central state level, but you also have individual state level laws, right? Some of those individual state level laws have already accepted in principle that Christians can, yeah, low caste Christians can qualify for some of the quota provisions, right, which exists in their state level legal systems, right. But uh, the bugbear that the uh, proselytizing organizations have is that at central legislation level, right, so in, in an order which was passed already back in 1950, Christians have been, and Muslims as well, have been specifically excluded from access to reservations, right. Because the idea was that, well, Christians don't believe in caste. Well, they, they, they don't need access to these reservations, do they? Do they? Muslims say that they, they have no costs. They don't need access to reservations, do they? So since that time, the legislative position has been... Now, if you're denying reservation places to Christians, uh, it means that uh, you're denying access to what is considered widely in the Indian uh, social framework to be a kind of uh, entitlement, right? That oh, if, if only I was not Christian, yeah, if I, of the same caste, but if I, hadn't, if I hadn't been Christian, I would have had access to this system of quotas. But because I'm Christian, I don't have, right? So um, what, what that means is that the, either there is a kind of a block on proselytization in the sense that people don't see a point of becoming Christian and then losing their caste status, right? Um, or people simply hide their identity, right? So they, ha they you know, when they, go, when they go for the quota system, they say, you know, they use their, I don't know, traditional names, but then when they're at home, they may be like, when they're going to church, they're like John so-and-so, yeah, or Matthew so-and-so sort of thing, right? So, so it, it changes, so, and of course, such ideas of flipping identities are not unusual, right, anywhere in the world. So here is, and there's a lot of, and we don't, we don't have any systematic study of this, right, as far as I know, but there is a lot of anecdotal evidence which tells us that, actually, if you look at, on the ground, that that's the, I don't know if you've come across similar types of Thing you, you have as well, yeah. So I, I think most people who are familiar with India kind of know such stories, right? So they're quite widespread. But we need a very good research program on this in order to really establish what's been going on. Um, so anyway, so th the idea is that it's not just British law, actually. It's British law in combination with European Union law, right? Which has come in already in, in terms of case law, making of case law, the United Nations. So actually it's the same set of lobby organizations which go to <laughs> Geneva or New York, that go to Brussels, yeah, uh, or Strasbourg, and they go, go to London. And, and of course part of the operation is run from here because you have the international Dalit Solidarity Network, which is funded from here, which is funded by the church and, and the government as well, um, and which is linked to one of the lobby organizations which is lobbying for this organization here as well. So there is a kind of internationally orchestrated effort to convince the Indian government, if you like, right, to get rid of its blockage on the uh, access to reservations, the legislation which blocks access to reservations to Christians and Muslims and so on. Um, and so I, I, how we're looking at the situation in Britain is that actually Britain has become a kind of uh, proxy case 
right? The issue, there's, there's no problem in Britain as such, right? The real issue is to do with what's going on in India and the politics around caste which are being played around in India and the legalities as well, right? And there are parallel test case litigations constantly going on. I mean, there's good writing about this already in the Indian literature, the Economic Political Weekly and so on, about how test case, Christians are bringing test cases about the fact that they've been excluded from the quotas and so on. So you can see that there's a interplay. Nobody in Britain will tell you this, however. Right? It's only writers like me who've come in and said, look, there is a connection here. Right? Uh, none of the lobby organizations will admit to there being such an agenda. Right? Uh, the way they put the case is, well, it's an aspect of human rights, isn't it? You've got to do it. Like, you've got to provide against caste discrimination, blah, 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 blah. Right? So it's sort of looked upon as a very black and white kind of issue, and there's no transnational implications and, and, and so on. I think the picture is much more complicated than that. There is a kind of... Um, interplay between the glo global and the local or the national and the global, if you like, yeah, uh, in, in that sense. Um, now, one of the indicators, right, which, which tells us that caste is regarded as self-evident, evidently moral, right, or actually I shouldn't put it like that. One of the, yeah, the various things I'm going to talk about under this slide actually for, shows us that the, the idea that caste system is an inherently immoral institution leads to certain ways of talking about caste, right? And that's also translated into the way in which the le legislation has been passed, yeah, the way the consultations have been done, et and, and the general arguments which have been framed in relation to the need for legislation, how they've been constituted, if you like. Um, so one of the things that uh, you see in the, um, uh, as, as a feature of the, the, the process of who, who are the right people to consult, for this legislation. Most of the Hindu organizations, Sikh organizations, so on, they've been sort of left on the side, right? Except for the ones we, who already committed to the government kind of legislative agenda, right? So the dissenting organizations were, have largely, and, and actually we've tried to, because I'm also an activist, I've kind of worked with other people to get meetings with officials of this ministry and officials of this government department, etc., etc., in order to say to them, look, the, what you guys are doing, you haven't thought about what you're doing, right? You're going to start creating many more problems than you think you're solving, right? And in a, in a sense, you guys are also being used, right, for uh, an agenda which is exterior to Britain, right, and which, which potentially also damages Britain's interests, etc., etc., um, but we've had a, quite a hard time. We've, we've had some consultations with the Department of Communities and Local Government, with the Home Office and so on. But largely you see that there is an effort to kind of, one, one, the way, when you look at the way in which the research is conducted and, 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 and the way in which the uh, parliamentarians argue about the issue in, in, the, in, in Parliament, you find that there is a kind of blotting out of certain arguments, right? And, and it's very odd, I think, that that, that uh, happens. But it, it, you can also explain it because of this idea that caste is self evidently immoral. Because of this idea, it's very hard to argue against the legislation. In a sense, that's the bottom line, right? Uh, and it's very hard for me to, even, even after I finish the presentation, most of you will still come up with the idea that, well, India still has a caste system as legislation is necessary, right? I'm not trying to disabuse you of that idea. I'm just trying to <laughs> come here to kind of introduce some masala into your <laughs> You know, into your life, if you like. Yeah. Um, so, for example, one of the key proponents in the House of Lords, yeah, Lord Leicester, who is a hu very famous human rights lawyer. In fact, he was one of the ins chief architects of the original Race Relations Act that we have in Britain today. Yeah, which, or at least we have the descendants of that that legislation operating in Britain today. Lord Leicester, um, who himself is Jewish, right? Uh, maybe he's a bit of a lapsed Jew. I'm not sure, like secularized Jewish guy, right? Um, but he he spoke out in Parliament and said. I don't see why research is required in this area, right? It's self-evident, if you like, right? That there must be something like caste discrimination. All we need to do is get ahead and legislate it, right? Uh, of course, if you ask the guy what is caste, he wouldn't be able to tell you, right? How does caste function, right? He wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, but he's got an army of people working under him, and, and part of the, those people are also the people who are writing the reports for the Equality and Human Rights Commission and so on. And in fact, if you see the links between all these different organizations, they're amazing. National Secular Society, Equality and Human Rights Commission, the church, church organizations, Dalit organizations, Ambedkarite organizations, MPs, etc. It's very nicely threaded together, right? So once you start saying that there's a proselytizing agenda here, right, the National Secular Society pipes up and says, ha, huh, why isn't Britain introduced the caste discrimination legislation yet? Why hasn't it implemented it? Right? So, you could, well, they are a secular organization. They're avowedly secularists. What have they got to do with some kind of distant proselytizing agenda in India or whatever? Right? 
So you can see how there's a kind of smoke and mirrors game, right, constantly being played here. And of course, some of the people who are pro the legislation, like Lord Avery, I've, I've cited him here as well, um, he's on the executive board of the National Secular Society. So it works like that as well. The, you can see there's an individual, in terms of who the individuals are, that there is a kind of spread, um, if you like. Um, yeah, this is actually already in 20, 2008 when the, there, there's an organization called the Hindu Forum of Britain who was sort of, has tended to be a kind of spokesperson organizations for Hindu interests in Britain. They were consulted back in 2008, apparently, but when nobody else was told about the issue. Um, they produced a report which showed how uh, various organizations like CARE and other organizations, evangelical organizations, actually have people staffing the offices of various MPs in Parliament. Right? So they were already trying to push this through the, uh, through the parliament. And, and actually, once that report came out, the HFB was really slammed. Right? They were blackboard kind of thing. They said, oh, how dare you? And they were very criticized for outing all these guys like, and what they, were, what they were doing. So anyway, the, you have this. Um, Kate Green, who is, who is a Labour, 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 current Labour Party equality spokesperson, said, a uh, single case of caste discrimination is enough to act, right? Again, this idea, the, the redolence of, of the, the message that um, it's an inherently immoral institution. And then you have some counter sort of <laughs> findings, right? You find John Ashworth, who is, a, who is the MP, one of the MPs in Leicester, um, says, oh, he, you know, I have a letter actually on, on file where he says, I've never ever seen, a, in all my years as an MP, I've never seen a case of caste discrimination. Nobody's ever talked about it, right? Why is it significant that he's an MP for Leicester? because Leicester has actually the six times the level of the South Asian population than the average England and Wales, right? Now, you'd have expected to find some type of caste discrimination there, right? Where, where is it? Kind of thing. Um, it's interesting also in terms of the figures that people have cited. So Lord Harris, who was the, the bishop who originally introduced the amendment, um, uh, speaks about something like half a million uh, Dalits in existence in Britain, right? Uh, his colleague, Lord Leicester has talked about uh, 50,000 to about 200,000, right? But in, in the same breath, he said that we don't, we don't have access to any accurate figures. Research is needed. Um, more recently, there's, there's an MP in the House of Commons who said that there's one million Dalits existing in Britain, right? Uh, the official figures for the number of Hindus in the last census of 2011 is 800 and just under 850,000. But there are one million Dalits who are living in Britain, right? So y you have anywhere from between 50,000 to one million, right? Nobody wants to be outdone. Every time, probably next year or this year later, you'll see it's inflated to 1.5 million or something like that. And of course, as soon as you say, say, say Dalit, presumptively you're, you're suggesting quite strongly that here is a widely discriminated against population, right? It's not enough just to say, I mean, it's, it's not just the fact that people are saying, oh, here's just a kind of bland figure about a, a group of people, right? uh, a vague group of people. No. Um, if I say Dalits, is it very fairly clear to you what, who Dalits are? Yeah. Some people are nodding. Some people, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe say a couple Sh of words. Yes, I should. No. Yeah, yeah. Dalits. Dalits are. Dalits is a kind of political term, actually. Yeah. It means uh, <coughs> oppressed. Uh, it was used, uh, I think, uh, or. or it, including by uh, uh, Ambedkar, right? B. R. Ambedkar, who became the kind of one of the uh, key spokespeople, even already in the pre-independence periods, for for the cause of uh, Dalit population in India, right? So they are broadly equated to low caste people, but there's nobody will tell you, oh, this person is a Dalit, this person is not, right? So the, there is no official term like Dalit, right? In the sense that it's not it's not a legislative category anywhere in the world. In India, the legislative categories are scheduled tribes and scheduled castes. And these are specifically listed set of caste-based organizations, right? Or caste-based entities, let's say, jatis, um, which are, find themselves uh, referred to in the 1950 provision, yeah, the legislative provision at central level or in various, various state level enactments. And then there are a whole set of uh, what are known as other backward castes. But these are also lists, right? So in India, you have a situation where nobody has to decide are you upper caste? Are you lower caste? Do you deserve this? There's no such question. Are you Dalit? Right? If your name is on the list, like as a caste, then it's assumed that you, you have access to this and that quota. In England, what's going to happen is people are going to have to decide, well, well what caste are you? Uh, like, let's say somebody like me, maybe somebody might say, oh, I'm an Oshwal, or am I a Visa Oshwal, am I a Vaishya, or, you know, exactly what level of caste 
are you going to argue that I am? And, and then you have to ask the question in relation to Prem, am I upper cost or lower cost? Right? Or, and, and can I simply say, you know, tomorrow I can say, look, Prem, you know, he, he discriminated me against, uh, against me on grounds of my, my cost. Right? And, and most people will probably say, oh, yeah, there's something to that. Yeah. Let's say that, that happened to me in an employment situation. Right? Like, let's say one of my students said, oh, Prakash is, you know, he's so chauvinistic about his own cost, you know, that he, he, think, he, he talks down to me, sort of thing. Cost discrimination. Right? Particularly if, if it was a student who's not particularly skilled or right? uh, not particularly able, sort of thing. So you, what you're doing is setting up a whole set of new types of scenarios yeah? where presumptively any Indian right? or Nepali or whatever is said to be inherently obliged to, yeah, by virtue of his religion, to discriminate on grounds of caste. Right? That's, that's the popular kind of understanding of what caste is or caste system is. Um, but when you translate that into legislation, and particularly civil law anti-discrimination legislation, when you can bring claims for compensation, right, that's, what's, that, that's what you're facing. Right? So my university will have, probably have to settle the case with that guy. Right? They, they are none the wiser. They don't know what caste I am. They don't know what caste the student is, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? But to avoid any scent of any stain of cost discrimination going into the publicity, into the media, they're, they're going to have to say, okay, let's just settle this case, give the person 50,000 pounds, sign an agreement not to disclose the nature of the settlement or the claim. That's it. Can you see how, in reality, it'll translate itself, right? And that's the kind of danger that we've been trying to alert people to, but uh, people are not interested, yeah, it seems like. Uh, in fact, the, in, from 2010 to 2013, they made it into an obligation to introduce this legislation. So that's what's going to happen in future. Let's, let's, I mean, you can, you can watch the scene, and if you think I'm joking about this kind of issue. Now, what's the significance of the, the link between caste and race? Now, in recent history, of course, the caste, caste and race idea was most famously brought together, uh, albeit unsuccessfully, in the campaign by uh, Dalit and church organizations and so on in the Durban conference on, on racism. Right, in 20, uh, 2001, to have it set as part of the declaration from the conference that caste is an aspect of race right? uh, and, is an, uh, and should be treated as if it's racial discrimination. That was actually successfully fended off by the then Indian government. Yeah? Uh, so it never saw itself go into the, into the declaration. And India actually historically has said that yeah, ever since the United Nations uh, declaration on, uh, Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination was instituted in, in the 1960s. Indian position always, has always been that it doesn't include caste. Right? However, if you look at the implementing bodies of the same convention at UN level, they've tended to take a different view. They've tended to say, well, there is a provision on dissent in the convention, and that provision allows us to read into it that the uh, caste is imputed. Right? Because caste is a kind of dissent-like form of social organization. So it must be part of the convention system. India still always resisted that interpretation. And of course, that lends a quite an interesting ambiguity to the international law, international human rights law position on whether or not uh, caste discrimination has already been made unlawful, if you like. Because if you have a key signatory state which consistently maintains an objection in international law, then the presumption should be, I would argue, as an inter partly as an international lawyer, or with my international law hat on, that uh, actually you can't legitimately contend with that interpretation, right? Uh, because it's consistently objected to right? as, a, as a state signatory since the beginning of, of it. But um, uh, on the other hand, those who are pro uh, uh, proponents of the legislation like Britain has uh, con constantly or consistently say that, no, now India should change its mind and because caste, is be caste discrimination has become an obligatory kind of thing to protect against in international law terms as well. Uh, and of course, they bring those arguments to British courts as well. So when you've seen litigation, right, there's been some recent litigation in the UK. Now, remember, caste discrimination has not yet been implemented. It's still, it is on the statute book. It hasn't been brought into force of law. Yeah? It's not yet been implemented, although there is an obligation to implement it. Um, but you have supervening case law, like this Turkey case in particular, where they argue that, well, look at the EU race directive. The EU race directive was intended to bring into play the International Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The way in which the International Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination is interpreted is that it includes caste. Therefore, caste is already unlawful under UK law, right? Because we have a provision on race, and that allows us to interpret our provision on race in conformity with the directive, the EU directive. So, of course, we already, we already have the legal provisions we need. We don't need anything else. Judges can act. Right? And in fact, the judges have agreed right? in 
2014, there was a case which has been going on for about a couple of years, but in 20, late 2014, it was decided by the Equality, um, Employment Appeal Tribunal, which is at the level of the High Court, which means now it's a precedent, right, that uh, lawyers advising tomorrow on the problem of caste discrimination, let's say that that scenario that we played out with Prem, right, um, that could actually be seen as an actionable type of thing, yeah, that I, so I could bring to the em Employment Tribunal or he could bring to the Employment Tribunal. So, yes. Now, um, one other thing I have to say about the, uh, the link to Orientalism and race, and, and actually this is the most interesting thing, because the World Conference in 2001 or the UN bodies on the elimination of racial discrimination, so on, that's one thing. But actually, when you look at the deeper background to the link between caste and race, caste, in the Orientalist writing, particularly of the 19th century, you find that there is a deep linkage between the idea of caste and the idea of race, right? Now, you have to go back to the kind of Orientalist account which said that the Brahmins are the keepers of the Hindu religion or the Bra 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 Brahmanical religion, right? They are part of the Aryans, yeah, who are invaders or immigrants to India. Uh, they came in, brought their religion, laws, and institution to subjugate a native population of Indians, right? The native, that native population of Indians today represents the oppressed classes of India, right? Who are legislatively regarded as yeah, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and so on, or broadly, popularly known as Dalits. Um, so that whole scenario has been constructed by the Orientalist account of India, the Aryan invasion of India, right? How the Aryan invasion led to a split in different racial configurations of Indian society and so on. Right? Now, of course, in, in the larger social science literature and even in the hard science literature, that account has been quite heavily disputed. Right? Uh, but you can see that it implicitly, implicitly carries forward. Right? Um, and what's really interesting is that there is also now, uh, I mean, as, as part of this baggage, there is a distinction on grounds of religion as well. So the Brahmanical, Brahmanical religion has been brought in by the Aryan conquerors. Right? That's so that race yeah, is separate by virtue of the fact that it follows a particular religion. Right? The indigenous people are different by virtue of the fact that they follow their own religions. If you like, right? uh, and today they are legitimized in uh, converting to Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or whatever uh, because they were never really. Yeah, this idea of Brahminism was always imposed on them. Right? Um, so, so that, if you like, Orientalist account from the 19th century onwards right, has become so influential that it's penetrated all kinds of accounts of Indian society and culture right, since then. Since then right? As I said, it's begun to be disputed and it's complicated by some writers and so on, but its basic, if you like, integrity is still maintained. Right? And there you, there you can see the deeper reason why it becomes a very logical thing. Yeah? It's a self-evident thing that why we have to make caste as an aspect of race. Right? When you say as an aspect of it's quite significant, it means that it's like that. Yeah? It's, a, it's a dimension of that. It's a facet of that. Right? It's racial discrimination in another guise, if you like. Right? So it's very, very, very significant that um, you have to, in a way, subscribe to the idea of different races in India if you're going to subscribe to the idea of this idea of caste discrimination, right? the way it's been legislated here. Um, uh, from moment to moment, it's not really clear yeah, uh, whether or not the target yeah, in the, um, uh, according to the, the pro organizations, including the writers like uh, Anpurna Ware or David Keane, uh, etc., etc., um, when they talk about the aims of the legislation, it's not clear, including the MPs, members of the House of Lords. Yeah? Um, what is the target? Is it cost? Because some MPs will say, uh, Everybody agrees in this house, i.e. the House of Commons, that uh, we should end caste. Right? Caste itself is an und undesirable form of social organization. Some people will say caste system. Yeah, uh, One of the House of Lords members is famously, uh, not famously, I'll make it famous because I put it in the title of my next paper, uh, says this ancient system of caste. Right? Now, of course, by saying that, what he's doing is going back to the old Orientalist account, right? which says that Brahmins are the keepers of this religion, right? They are the priests of this religion, right? Uh, not only are they the priests of this religion, they are the priests of a false religion, right? Now, this buys into the Protestant account of Indian society, yeah, the Protestant missionary account of Indian society, to the extent that just like the Protestants in Europe said that the Catholics have a set of priests, right? But they are purveyors of a false religion, they are keeping their people in ignorance, you find an exactly parallel set of accounts translating to 
uh, interpret the data that, co that comes increasingly from India by the Orientalists, right? So it, there, the Brahmins become the priests of this false religion who keep their people in ignorance, right? They institute the caste system, etc., etc., right? They lead their people into idolatry and false worship and all kinds of horrible things. And of course, it means that all Indians are destined for hell unless they convert to Christianity, right? Um, so, so you've got that, those kinds of accounts kind of still very much kind of part of the furniture, if you like, of the, um, yeah. I mean, these quotes are interesting. You can just have a look at them, yeah. But I think it just tells you, kind of reinforces the kind of thing that I've been saying, yeah. Uh, so sometimes it's a part of Hindu religion, sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes this and that. Um, and some of this I've already managed to talk about, yeah. And, and I hope there are questions about this kind of Orientalist background, which I haven't managed to go into a lot. But my, my main hypothesis in this paper is actually that it's, you know, the missionary accounts and the Christian theological accounts upon which the Orientalists depended, right? There, there is a strong kind of case to be made for the mutual dependence of, of those two kinds of accounts. Um, uh, have actually infiltrated and become part of our contemporary knowledge about India and its social structure. Right? And part of that knowledge is our certainty about the caste system as an inherently uh, immoral institution. And it's only with that kind of idea that one can go about legislating yeah, in a country like Britain when it comes to, um, uh, when it, when it comes to caste. So, yeah. And, and I suppose, um, as a writer, one can say that secular theorizing has taken over the, uh, one, what once were if you like, theological certainties. Yeah? So the theological certainties have become secularized in contemporary social science accounts of Indian culture and society. Right? Uh, so that's still a fixed idea. We don't know much in reality about how Indian social structures functions, what jati is, what varna is. Right? Um, I, I would certainly agree that there is such a thing as jati in, in, as, part, as a strong part of, strong component of Indian Social, social structures, what it is, how it functions, what give, ri give rise to it cont in contemporary times, in historical times, etc. We don't know, right? Uh, but part of the, you know, you know, even the Catholics, right? The Catholics regarded caste as a secular institution. They were not bothered by it. As soon as the Protestant missionaries, by the mid early 19th century in India, as soon as they began to be the dominant force, trying to convert people and so on, uh, you see this fusing of Hinduism as a religion, caste as a form of social structure. False religion, evil social structure, yeah, or immoral social structure, ties together, right? And we are still living with that today, right? So I think I'll stop there. Um, just leave you with these nice quotes from Lord Singh and Baroness <laughs> Srila Flather. Contemporary manifestation of yeah, Orientalism in, in, in the members of the House of Lords. Okay, thank you, Prakash. Thank you for a very rich, albeit contentious, talk, I think. And uh, I'll just ask a brief question which will allow you to maybe elaborate a little bit, uh, which has got to do with the question of minorities within minorities in Europe and how discursive injury is framed uh, either as humiliation or as exclusion from sociopolitical, sociopolitical exclusion, right? So these, of course, translate as what, in the first case, that, ex uh, that discursive injury, the idea of discursive injury is seen as humiliation. In the second case, it's seen as, uh, uh, you know, the, the first case is seen as impeding access to humanity. The second case is seen as impeding access to a, polit uh, a community, as it were, in a sense, right? So I was wondering how this plays out uh, in terms of, say, uh, all these debates. How, how is it framed? I mean, obviously, there's this discourse of humiliation. There's the discourse of uh, exclusion. And sometimes it's both. Uh, do, you, do you mean in my discourse or the way in which the case is made for yeah, the, the legislation? Is, the case is made. Huh. Okay, so so the, the legislators or the proponents yeah, of the legislation yeah, would yeah. say, uh, here is a uh, potentially oppressed population, they need legal protection, and, and we should provide that. Right. right? So you're, 
if I suppose if we go by that account, then we would have to agree, as most parliamentarians and you know uh, representatives of the press and, and intellectuals and so on have tended to do, right? Um, but that hides, um, I would say, a much deeper kind of problem, intellectual problem, a problem of knowledge, how we conceptualize things. What exactly are we trying to do when, it, when we are trying to legislate on, on these terms, right? Um, so I would say that it's not comp being complicated for the sake of being complicated, but I, th I think that in a way we are so much under this cloud of a secularized version of the Christian theological accounts of other traditions um, that that forces, if you like, let's say if you are from an Indian background in, in, in Britain, and unless you say, of course, you're Dalit and so on, which of course means that you get all the privileges and you get legislation made in your name and blah, blah, blah. But if you're broadly of an Indian background, you, um, I think today you might find yourself as one of the excluded uh, population. And being made into a potential target of legal action by virtue of a process in which neither you nor, nor members of your, of, the, of your community have had a say. And even to the extent that they had a say, the terms of discourse were so, so asymmetrical, right, in the sense, because I, the, hence I was trying to emphasize this idea of inherent immorality and so on, that Indians would have no option but to either say, like, let's, let's examine the options that they would have. They would, they would have to say that, oh, once the caste system was moral, but today it's not, right? Like, that's what Gandhi did, right? Uh, or you would be so embarrassed and say, you have to accept that there is a caste system uh, and either try to reform Hinduism from, from within, which is in a way also what Gandhi did, uh, or you come away from the fold of Hinduism at all, which is what Ambedkar did, right? Um, so... Maybe there are a number of other options. If people can think, we can talk them through. But basically, you can't contest the terms, the terms of framing the idea of the caste system itself. Yeah. That's not permitted. And in fact, in fact, nobody. If you look at all my colleagues who work within different Indian organisations, so on, nobody's even able to put a decent intellectual case together for why this is rubbish. Basically, right? Intellectually, it's rubbish, right? As a case for legislation, but it's been it's got through, right? So what's going on, kind of thing. Yeah. So in a way, at some level, they have to, and hence my also this thing about colonial consciousness. It's not only the members of the House of Lords who are under kind of a colonial consciousness, it's members of the Indian communities themselves who, in a way, at some level, have to accept the Orientalist account of caste and its system. Right? They have to accept it. And the way they get out of it is to say, yeah, you're right, either we need legislation, or Hinduism is evil, isn't it? Or, yes, you're right, we, we do need reform. That sort of stuff, right? So you, you, you're forced into a kind of asymmetrical dialogical position from day one. Yeah. If, I don't know if that answers yeah, your question, it's but it's a kind of good... I think we have lots of questions. Yeah. Uh, two up first. Let me see how to frame this. You're saying that in the understanding of caste within the legislation here, uh, it is equated that our is being thought of as a part of race. Yeah? So, what is the conception of race here? Because it seems to me that it is not politically correct to talk about race as anything but a social uh, social category, right? So, you have to talk about race as something which is performed. But what you're also saying is that we have very little research about how caste is actually performed, or what. So, so how how does that square? I mean, I mean, is is that really what you are also saying that you know? They're trying to make legislation about a system which is a social category that they don't actually know how acts. Um, uh, with respect to the broad idea of race, yes. um, I'm not problematizing that for the moment, right? One could, as you, I think, you're kind of you've given one type of problematization of it, which is that it's politically incorrect, nobody really accepts the idea of separate human races today, and, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but of course, that's not the only way in which the idea of race has been used. Like, so, you know, it was, it was, an, it was also in the title of the Race Relations Act in, in Britain of 1965, 68, 76. So it has had a currency, right, uh, which has outlasted the Second World War and so on. It's, so in that way of using race, actually, 
they they are trying to use race as something like a group of people, which is identified by some some type of common characteristics, right? And of course, the idea of race is also then an aspect of race is also color, and uh, nationality, yeah, the, and, and so on. So the British legislation actually tries to build build in an idea of race which is relatively flexible. It also has a, a um, the idea of ethnic and national origins, right? So Sikhs have actually su su successfully been able to claim that they are uh, an ethnic group for the purpose of race for the purpose of the Race Relations Act and therefore today the Equality Act. Um, so it's used in, in a much more, in a way, interesting way, right? So I, do, I don't want to grapple with that right now. I, I do have my issues with that as well, which, which we can talk about later on, because I think one can say that there are broader dynamics here which also need critiquing when one imports an idea such as race. But let's leave that aside for the moment. Uh, but certainly you can see that in the 19th century writing on race, the idea of having a common religion is very strongly linked to the idea of race, right? And I think that's not gone away yet, yeah? particularly when you're talking about caste, as I was trying to say. So I hope that partly at least, yeah. Yes? Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, along the same lines. You said earlier on in your paper that uh, Indian organizations in Britain were organized along caste lines because that's the way they organized themselves. Wouldn't it be possible then, instead of trying to intellectualize, if you like, about what caste might be and how it connects with all kinds of other things, to simply look at how the people have organized themselves and then uh, make that a basis? And then use that as the basis for legislation if there has to be or no legislation if that appears better. Mm. Uh. Yeah, that would be one way of doing it, yeah. Uh, so I don't know your name, but, you know, uh, one of the things you're saying is how caste is performed, let's say, right? So in a way you're saying a similar type of thing, yeah? So what is the significance of this form of social organization for the kind of people that we're talking about, right? Uh, it would have been more interesting. It would, we would have learned something had that been the way of proceeding, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, but given the fact that, again, this thing about the inherent, inherently kind of discriminatory or immoral institution that caste is, it seems like they, they can't get past that. The researchers, the people who are committed to the legislation, nobody is able to seem, seemingly get past that problem, right? That's that, that vision of Indian social structure is so strongly wedded to that, that it seems impossible to break out of that. You know, uh, I, I would definitely be one, one of those people who's, who's arguing for better understanding of how caste is performed, not only in the diaspora, in India as well, Right? Because we simply don't have the kind of depth of studies of that type that we need. Yeah? Take it away from this kind of like discrimination, immorality, blah, blah, blah. Right? Try to understand what's going on, really. Yeah? All the reporting that you see in India on caste at the moment, like let's say an offense happens, let's say a rape happens. Right? It could easily be attributed today to, to caste. Right? That's what systematically happens, actually. Right? It's crime is reported, caste crime. Right? Something happens, caste related. Right? Nobody does any serious research. Yeah, the media hypes it up. Yeah, there are certain filters. Yeah, so in a way, this is a problem in India as well. If you look at the Indian media, Indian intellectuals, and so on, they are so much bought into this way of talking about caste uh, that they haven't done the homework themselves. I know some people who are very genuine and they are trying to work on this, right? Uh, but it's still very much as, a, as a, at a stage of infancy. Um, and so one of the things, of course, you can accuse me of saying is that what well, you're saying that. There is no such thing as a caste system. What is there then? Right? And I, I would agree with you. If you're going to argue with me in that way, I would agree with you, actually. I would sympathize with you because you're right that you, you can't just say that this theory doesn't work anymore. In a way, the best theories are the, one, the ones which are kind of replacements for ones that are being dis discarded. Right? This is like classic kind of Thomas Kuhn type of stuff. Yeah? Uh, the new paradigms are only really shifted once you've got a kind of theory in waiting, which is much more appealing, yeah? which, which answers to the problems that the old paradigm cannot any longer answer. Right? Um, and so you have a situation where there's so, many, so much evidence to show that the intellectual case for a caste system, which is inherently discriminatory, is so flawed. Right? It's so much implicated in this kind of theological writing, orientalist writing, and so on. But where's the replacement today? We don't have it, actually. We don't know what Indian, how Indian social structures really function. And that's what we need. We need serious research on this. Yeah, not this cloudy kind of 
I think uh, Tour wants to come, come back. One of the ways that I see research being done on castes in India is looking at electoral politics, looking at who people vote yeah. for and, and why and what caste they profess and so on and so forth. And it's, um, how, how does that function, or does that function in a, in a British context? Uh, um, are there any parallels? Is there any, anything from that knowledge base? Because, I mean, if you're talking about broad sort of um, readings of what caste means, then I guess what people vote is one way of looking at it. But does that translate in any way? Or? Um, from what I've done without doing any sort of serious research into that specific question, I would say no, it doesn't doesn't work out in Britain like that, right? But I, of course, you've got to go back to the Indian situation and see how the idea of caste itself is politicized. Quite, you, you know, in the in the in the later colonial period, it's already there. In fact, already from the late 19th century, once you start looking at the census writings and the British anthropological efforts and so on, and then the separate electoral, the case for separate electoral quotas and stuff like that, even in the pre-independence period, the, the, that chain reaction, is, if you like, is already set off in terms of electoral politics and so on, right? Group membership, who gets what, that sort of thing, right? So Nicholas Dirks, in a way, is quite right, yeah, to say that the political sort of definition of Indian society today is completely, the caste is completely central to it. Right? I don't go whole, whole, whole hog with him because he seems to say that there wasn't a car he agrees that there wasn't a caste system in India before, but there has become one now. I don't agree with that. But I, I do agree that the politicization around caste has become so central to the Indian political scene. Mm -hmm. right? So in a way, you need a background like that for the politicization of caste to occur, I would hypothesize. And Britain hasn't provided that background yet. Ethnic politi politics is there to a certain extent. And it's getting more embedded, right? Like so, today you see, you know, some one of my friends who who is sort of more like a maverick. You know, he's he's worked in these various Indian organisations before, in the Hindu Forum of Britain and so on. But now he's a sort of indep independent public intellectual. He, he one of his blog articles is titled titled "Is Labour Going Sharia?" Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there there is a kind you know the eth ethnic vote catching from different constituencies and so on, like we'll do what you want on Palestine or Kashmir if you vote for us type of thing is there, right? It's already there as part of the landscape, right? It hasn't gone down to the level of cost. I don't think it will. I don't think it will, but. Okay, Lena? Hi, uh, and uh, thank you for your talk, and I apologize for having to, to leave in, in the middle, and uh, I also apologize for knowing absolutely nothing about India. Um, my <laughs> question uh, is, and Aubrey, um, um, my, my question relates more to maybe a theoretical or methodological uh, question. Um, I come from studying uh, Zimbabwe and looking at sort of longer historical trajectories of how uh, Christianity has informed contemporary culture and, and how that original uh, colonial impact has has shaped uh, contemporary cultural ideas about yeah. uh, identity and, and, uh, yeah. and morality and, and that sort of thing. And my, my question goes to, basically, I can very easily make a case to say present-day Zimbabwean uh, norms around marriage and sexuality are the product of a, a colonial violence, basically. Mm -hmm eradicating uh, existing uh, cultural and uh, so social norms um, and and the, the reason that people in Zimbabwe today believe very deeply that Christianity is uh, uh, the bedrock of uh, Africanity is a product of, of that original violence. Now I might name very well make that argument sure. but that doesn't help anyone very much uh, in, in terms of uh, creating political projects uh, in the present day. And so my, my question, I think, maybe is um, what, what can this type of uh, deconstruction uh, do for present day political mobilization? Um, from my point of view, uh, what it's helping us to do is to actually mount a serious intellectual challenge mm. to the case for legislation um, 
I don't see it just as a kind of deconstructive exercise. Uh, I don't see it just as a genealogical exercise. Uh, I see it as a way of trying to explain why it is almost necessary for Westerners to think that there is a caste system in India and that it's, in, it's inherently immoral. Right? Why a, a culture ha has to think like that about another culture. And, and, and I think, I mean, that's not the end of the story. You know, I would agree with you. I mean, that, that doesn't, you know, like, so what? You know, you can say. But then spin-offs from that, you know, like, then we begin perhaps to ask very serious questions about what types of social organizations are we talking about then, right? New questions will come up, which enable us to say, yeah, the existing theoretical framework is actually deficient. Yeah, it's misleading. Um, it's actually, we can say, we can even go to the extent of saying that because it's so embedded in Orientalism is actually, as Edward Said himself says, right? It is something that the West uses to make sense of its own experience in vis-a-vis -vis another culture, right? It, it isn't something that tells us anything about Indian social structures per se, right? Your situation is slightly different. I'm not really sure if I can help <laughs> help your question because, because you're, the terrain with which you're working is actually in a way, dif different, right, I think. Um, I would still say that in every such situation, intellectuals have to play a role to try to enable people to see how it is that they came to frame the arguments that they do today. Uh, and through what, through what framework does that vision of life or society or whatever operate? I think it's very important to do that, you know? Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to get rid of their commit commitment to Christianity and all the theological baggage that goes with that. Mm -hmm. it, may, it may not result in that. Right? Um, but it may result in some very interesting critiques of the way in which they've become Christians today. It may do, it may do that. You know, alternative movements might come up. Right? Uh, and I, I would even probably say, well, there's, nothing, there's no reason why they should, they should stop being Christian, but they, they should still examine the way in which they are talking about Christianity and the obligations that come with being a Christian, at the very least, you know. Ideally, as a pagan myself, I don't, I, I don't believe in Christianity, I will never become a Christian, right? Uh, and I don't find Christianity as a convincing answer to life, right? But I can't deny the huge accomplishments that Christians have uh, sort of made to the culture of the world, right? I mean, the, the very idea of scientific progress would not have occurred without Christianity. I can't deny that. I mean, next year? Is that next year's seminar? <laughs> no, one can easily show that. But, uh, you know, I mean, because my, the basic idea, kernel of the idea is that because Christianity is a religion, what it does is that it sets up a way of... Uh, within a, it sets up a dynamic within a culture which enables it to uh, frame its configuration learning of learning in theoretical terms, right? So knowledge is theory in the West. Knowledge becomes theoretical. Once you accept that, uh, it shows why there is a quest within one culture to look for laws which explain, yeah, theoretically explain different dimensions of existence, the cosmos, right? Uh, and the, where way, it, the winner writes the, the history, mm -hmm. but uh, we shouldn't take that uh, debate now. I think we should stay with it. I'm, I'm not speaking from the position of winner. And I, I, I don't speak from a position of any type of winner. <laughs> so... Texts you refer to, yeah. I would say. Which, which text do I refer to? I mean, the, come on, the genealogy of, of old white men in, in you know, uh, history of philosophy, for instance, right? Um, but look, you, I mean, look, Western culture has, give, has given us natural science. If you have a better explanation for that, please tell me. Well, if there were no, had been no colonialism, if uh, all the colonialist explorers had died from illnesses when traveling, then it might have been another epistemological hegemony that had invented what we call science or a variation of it. So it, it's basically... Um, that Actually, you f you have more problems with your your theory than I do with mine because mm -hmm. you you for your theory uh, science seems to depend seems to depend on colonialism. Mine doesn't. Well, I thought that's what, what you were saying. No, I'm not saying that at all. 
I'm saying Christianity uh, as a config, the, the kind of configuration that Christianity generates helps science to develop. Yeah? Science develops within rel religious cultures of the type of Christianity. That, that Christianity is. Outside colonialism, Sorry? Christianity can be understood as separate from colonialism. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, of course. So anyway, but that was a very long-winded response yeah, to... <laughs> sorry, but that was a major digression. But, but yes, I, I think that one should not give up, one should carry on. As intellectuals, we have a responsibility to really unpick what's, what's the kind of received ideas that people have acquired over a period of time. Uh, particularly if there have been a consequence of violence. I think this violence thing it has, has a very strong role to play in the formulation of colonial consciousness that, that I mentioned. Um, and that's very important. That's, way, that's how Indians have basically absorbed the colonial account of their own societies. That's the basis on which they fight their politics today. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not only, but that, that f f pro provides that kind of uh, shell, yeah? according to which they frame their demands terms. The, the way in which they speak to outsiders, to Westerners, for instance. Yeah? They, they, just as we speak, there is a, there's a world conference on, um, on caste discrimination. Right? I think one of your representatives from here, the International Dalit Solidarity Network, is probably attending that summit in Washington. Now, why are Indians having a summit on discrimination in India, in Washington? What the hell is going on? That's colonial consciousness. Yeah. Question, was there a, connect, a question? No, connect? I have a question, but I mean, would you not, it's not connected with this, would you not rather continue with this other discussion that we were having because it's, Closer to us. No, I think uh, we should uh, respect the, the theme of a uh, of a uh, Yeah. Maybe we can yeah, come so back. That's why to people, later. why people are here. So yeah. I'd like to take take the discussion. I'm not sure how much is because uh, I misunderstand you or what you're saying. I, I have to unpack a lot of uh, yeah. what I'm saying it's is a huge discussion. there are a lot of things that yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in that case, can I ask the question that I was planning on asking? Yeah. Maybe, uh, because we might be running out of time, we take three questions and, uh, and then Prakash picks them up. So, Fry and you ask your question, if there's another one, we package it as one. Okay. So, do you want to go first and then... Okay. Um, I would like, well, this is possibly fairly big as well. Uh, I would like you to say something about the connection between caste and class in the British situation. Because obviously, uh, not obviously, but from what I know, I mean, uh, castes uh, command different economic powers. And I was wondering whether, at, at some level, uh, what a caste discrimination law, if you like, in Britain I'm talking about, uh, whether that could shade into some kind of economic discrimination which would fit more easily into you know, an understanding of general law in, in Britain, whether that would, yeah. that would be... Yeah, okay. Um, so, mm -hmm. can okay, we take yeah, a couple questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fry and then Kelly. Sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, what it seems to me that you're saying is that paradoxically um, this type of legislation is actually an impediment to equality for some citizens in, in the UK. Um, so maybe it's a bit of a hypothetical question, but uh, assume that this legislation was introduced under um, the guise of an aspect of religion, as you mm -hmm. almost suggested mm -hmm. in the beginning. Uh, do you think it would then be more uh, legitimate or not? And would you? And do you still think it would have um, the same shades of Orientalism, or would they be different shades or no shades at all? Mm. Yeah, okay, Kelly, and then you can respond. Yeah, I have a similar kind of point of departure of this paradoxical nature as a suit. I mean, whether defined by within or from the outside, once you set up those boundaries, once you set up these categories of who is what, I mean, the same occurs with gender, sexuality, race, right? We put these categories out there, and then the same categories are basically used to discriminate. I mean, once you have like uh, quotas or affirmative action, or yeah. you need to be able to put these people in that box in order to say that you know, they've either been discriminated yeah. against or that they deserve some sort of yeah. compensation yeah. for okay. what it is they are. Yeah. 
Um, cost in class. Cost in class is a very interesting question. Um, if you look at the report writers of the, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission reports, they are at pains to stress that costs should be kept separate from class. Right? That's quite interesting. Um, so one of the things you have is that, you know, I mentioned about the Catholic uh, writers on, on, on India and how they viewed uh, caste or jati as a, uh, as a secular institution. Uh, one of the significances of the um, uh, predominance of the, uh, the Protestant account, which kind of become, is, is the way we, we, we have received the idea of the caste system today, is that not only did, did they reflect on the role of the Brahmins as the priests of uh, false religions that Indians follow, yeah, i.e. Brah Brahminism or Hinduism or whatever, they also drew upon their original critique of the Catholic social order, right? So this old social order of the priesthood and the nobility and yeah, the, the I don't know who, they're, they're very, they're like five different um, classes which are enunciated in the old medieval theological accounts of the kind of order of humanity. Yeah? Or the, or the, in fact, it's, it's a kind of cosmic order, right? Because it's, it's a divinely ordered situation. And of course, once you say that it's divinely ordered, right? The Protest old Protestants had to say that it's not divinely ordered, it's mandated by the priests, right? Uh, and, of course, it's immoral. So all they had to do, again, was to look at the Indian situation, right, from the European situation and just simply transplant that critique, right, to say, ah, well, here also you have a set of priests who allocate, yeah, people's position in a particular caste system, right, uh, which makes it uh, uh, an immoral system, right, because what, why is it immoral? I mean, from a theological perspective, it's very, very interesting to understand this, right? In, according to Protestantism, because it kind of unleashes this idea that yeah, people have individual autonomy, yeah, and they have it's up to you to seek your station in life. Yeah, you, you uh, it's you, it's down to you to make moral choices. Yeah, it's down to you to choose your vocation, right? And any vocation is equally valued in the eyes of the Lord, right? Um, that means that in that because of that account. The, the way in which the Catholics used to view the world became completely sort of immoral, if you like, right? And by the same token, the way in which the Indian social structure was read, right? it wasn't necessarily like that, but the way the Protestants read it, um, it lent itself to the same type of moral critique, right? Because obviously if you're a priest who says somebody's a member of this caste or that caste, you're denying their true vocation, right? It means that by using the idea of the divine, you're saying that, yeah, you're, you're unjustly or even immorally yeah, denying them the right to fulfill themselves, if you like. Uh, because all professions are, after all, you know, the, all these ideas are theological, vocation, profession, yeah, they are so deeply embedded within theology. It's really incredible. Right? So, and so today, of course, the Europeans have, let's say, or, or at least the Brits have a class, uh, class system, right? They have had for a number of centuries. Uh, but people don't regard that as an inherently immoral in institution. So that's why I'm trying to go back to this theological background, because it's the, the theology which helps us to see why some types of social organizations are, are seen as Im inherently uh, immoral and what others are not. Your question about the um, religion thing, no, I, I, don't, I don't think... Um, I don't think it would make a huge difference to... The, the fact that it's race is interesting and enables me to bring in all these things about the Aryan invasion and, and so on, right? So to, to add more layers to the kind of uh, Orientalism kind of thing that we've already been talking about. Um, but religion would be equally interesting because you can find just as many strands of yeah, uh, thinking about the Indian religion right, or religions, uh, which enable you to say that, well, actually, <laughs> this is also stacked up full of like Orientalist ideas and so on about, but it's just that we've trans transported, transplanted an account from being embedded in race to, to religion. Um, I mean, in, in some of the critiques that I've done in, in writing on the caste legislation, the, the kind of scenarios that you see Indians will enact in the courts will be very dramatic in, 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 in legal practice and court litigation and so on. Um, because generally speaking, Indians don't go to court for a moral principle, right? That's my hypothesis, right? You correct me if I'm wrong, right? Prem can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Indians go to court for revenge, uh, to teach each other a lesson, yeah? These kinds of things, yeah? So in other words, they're enacting a kind of social conflict that already exists within the 
socio-legal field into the courts, right? And it may well continue even after that, right? So the courts are used as one type of battering ram by one particular side in a in a conflict. Maybe both sides actually, yeah. And you, it's about India or same. Okay. To me, it's the same scenario, right? The way Indians litigate, with, the way the way Pakistanis litigate in England, it makes you laugh sometimes. Uh, and so I, I, it, that's a kind of quasi way of answering your question, right? So what will pan out in terms of um, the litigation scenario, in term, terms of uh, the cost discrimination provision will tell us, if we, if we work back, um, for what reasons Indians are going to court, right? To uphold what moral principles, right? And I would suggest there's no moral principle that they will be upholding, yeah? They'll be either going for the money or teach each other a lesson or for revenge or mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Yeah, uh, And that's, that would be something interesting to study, but I, I think it's, it's unfortunate that we've even come down to this, this point. Right? Uh, once, the le once the legislation is actually brought into force, which you may well do, um, you'll get all kinds of weird scenarios.